Tonight, Melbourne's race to reopen hits roadblocks. The hospitality industry blindsided. Entertainment venues dealt a new blow. Retail pleading for a rethink. Airlines put on extra flights to cope with a Queensland holiday rush. A heartbreaking plea as the search for a four-year-old girl missing from WA goes nationwide. Murder charges over the death of a pregnant Melbourne mum. A six-decade-old power plant reduced to rubble in seconds at Hazelwood. And exclusive, a star pie going to extremes on a mission in the United States. Live from Melbourne, 7 News with Peter Mitchell starts now. Good evening. Melbourne's race to reopen is running into obstacles with the hospitality, entertainment and retail sectors all pleading for a rethink. Cafes and restaurants have been blindsided by a new vaccine deadline that's left them struggling to find staff. 11.59 Thursday night. The city's dragon hot pot will finally reopen its doors. Yeah, we just can't wait. But a vaccine crackdown means they'll only be able to operate at limited capacity. Some of our staff is still not double dose, so we can only open the uh, outdoor area. Many hospitality staff thought they had until November 26 to be fully vaccinated. The Premier says their deadline is Friday. Staff need to be double, va double dose vaccinated, double yes. Vaccinated from this, from the yep, opening. the easing that we've done is predicated on people being double dose vaccinated. So the industry was certainly blindsided by this change. Many uh, hospitality workers will not be able to start on Friday as they had expected. We'll continue to lobby the government uh, for some type of grace period. It's only adding to the stress of finding enough employees. Melbourne suffering a staff shortage after the mass exodus of international workers over the past 21 months. It's a crisis in the hospitality industry. Tonight, there are more than 22,000 hospitality roles up for grabs in Victoria. Most in demand, baristas with almost 5,000 vacancies. There are more than 3,000 waitstaff jobs listed, followed by bartenders and chefs. Richmond Cafe Pillar of Salt needs two full-time staff. It's been pretty difficult, I think, because most venues are now looking for staff. While the Sporting Globe needs workers at its 35 venues across Melbourne. We've hired about 100 people in the last three weeks um, and still have about another 150 vacancies across all the venues. The city is preparing to reopen but still in the grip of a COVID emergency. 1,749 new cases, the lowest number in six days. But active case numbers continue to climb, now 22,476. 11 more Victorians have lost their lives to COVID, the death toll this year now 161. But in promising news, hospitalisations and ICU numbers have dropped from yesterday. Melina Saras joins us now. Melina, the Andrews government is refusing to budge on the vaccine deadline. Mitch, the rules won't change between now and Thursday. The original timeline for first and second doses was put in place for authorised workers, but the government explained today that staff in restaurant, pubs and bars don't fall under the authorised worker category and therefore must be double vaccinated if they want to serve any customers when lockdown ends. Mitch. Melina Saras at Carlton, thank you. And Victoria's entertainment industry has been dealt another blow after a clumsy mistake on the roadmap. Blake Johnson, plans to reopen this week have been crushed. Pete, cinemas, theatres and comedy clubs thought they were good to go on Friday to welcome 20 guests indoors, much like hospitality venues. But as you're about to see, a few mistaken words by our state government has had a huge effect. The founders of Comedy Republic aren't joking when they say they're closed due to a typo. Sunday's original roadmap said indoor entertainment venues could open with pubs and restaurants this week. But by yesterday, the word entertainment disappeared off the roadmap. No warning and little explanation. They opened the crack in the door just enough for us to get our fingers out and then slammed it shut. Eight sold-out shows this weekend will likely be cancelled and refunded. After so long in the dark, it was to be a much-anticipated return for live entertainment and cinemas. I think within hours of a typo being uh, up on a website somewhere, that was uh, corrected. And again, I apologise if there's any sense of 
that, uh, that a sector's been included that shouldn't have been. It might be a typo, but this isn't a text to your mum. This is a government roadmap. At Fitzroy North, a new pop-up vaccine clinic at a Moroccan soup bar promises food for vaccines. And $21 million will be spent helping vulnerable people get to centres like this. The Premier says vaccine passports and mandates will not come to an end on December 1, like in New South Wales. The unvaccinated will not be allowed in to most venues. This will be well into 2022. Well and truly into 2022. Why will we need a vaccination passport? If 96 out of 100 people are double vaccinated, who are we protecting ourselves against? Matthew Guy was speaking at a perfume store facing a tough ask to recover by Christmas. We had the bushfires, now we've had COVID. Just let us get back to earning a living. It's all we want to do. Retail can open outdoors this week, but like entertainment venues, outdoors doesn't always work. That has huge implications for small business. And to me, it says... If they don't understand small business now, seven years in as a government, they'll never understand small business. Yeah, I think this is a signal that they don't really know what the plan is for live entertainment. Blake Johnson, 7 News. Victoria's COVID emergency is forcing more elective surgery to be postponed, with 15,000 patients now on the waiting list. People's lives are being put at risk because their health conditions are worsening. Today, I get told that I can't have my knee surgery. I live on painkillers, OK? I chew painkillers like you eat Mentos. Elective surgery in Melbourne is currently limited to urgent Category 1 and limited Category 2 procedures. Queensland is in demand as holiday-starved Victorians snap up flights for Christmas and the New Year. Airlines are putting on extra flights to cope with the surge that comes with a warning. Queensland tourism operators are calling on holidaymakers to pack their bags. The water's warm, the sun is shining and we're ready for you. You can come to paradise from Christmas. Uh, so get up here, holiday in the tropics, you know you need it. And Victorians are hearing them loud and clear, following yesterday's announcement by the Queensland Government that we can head north from the 17th of December. Virgin Australia experienced a surge in bookings. The most popular flights are packed with Melbournians desperate to get to Brisbane, the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast. Nearly half of all bookings were for travel during December and January. Melbourne Airport is preparing for takeoff. There are 19 daily flights scheduled to Queensland when the gates open in December. I do think the airlines will very quickly scramble to add capacity. Now, we haven't got a lot of lead time and I think that will be the big challenge, but I'm expecting to see something like 30% of normal activity uh, by Christmas time. As Queenslanders prepare to welcome vaccinated visitors, there's a stern warning to locals to get the jab. Come the 17th of December, this virus will start coming into our state. The concern for travellers is the risk of getting locked out or locked in if there's an outbreak. Make sure you check your terms and conditions. Make sure you use every option available to ensure your money is protected. Well, you're seeing all the states and territories lift their vaccination rates. So it would be highly unlikely. Western Australia will be the only state keeping interstate visitors out for Christmas. And for travellers with their sights set on an overseas trip, there's still no confirmation on Victoria's plan for opening international flights. Unfortunately, we're quite late to the party here. So, so the challenge then is any further restrictions means we could see ourselves flying internationally over Sydney, which I think no Victorian wants. And Mitch, late today, the Health Department announced there will be no more red travel zones in New South Wales, meaning it will be even easier for Sydney residents to visit Melbourne. From tomorrow, fully vaccinated travellers from Sydney can arrive here without needing to quarantine or test and isolate. Mitch. Jade Vincent at the airport, thank you. Melbourne schools are putting COVID-safe plans to the test as they prepare to welcome back one million students from next week. Mike Amor is at Endeavour Hills this evening. And, Mike, there's a new approach to handling outbreaks. There is, Mitch. Primary and secondary schools like Glen Eagles here behind me are putting their COVID safe plans to the test with the staggered return to face-to-face -face learning. The big test comes from Friday and then next week when all year levels make their return to the classroom. And today the Education Minister revealed just how a COVID case will be managed to cause minimal disruption. If a case happens now, um, kids are back at home, 
for around 24 hours. We clean the school, we identify where that student has been, um, identify the primary close contacts, all the other kids come back to school and that's in about uh, around a 24 hour period. And I'll have more on the plan to keep students safe and in class later in the Bulletin, Mitch. Mike Amor at Endeavour Hills, thank you. Now, here's a look at the state of play in Victoria currently. After more than 1,700 new cases and 11 deaths, 88.8% .8 of Victorians have now had their first dose of a COVID vaccine. 68% are double-dosed. And we're back on track to hit the 70% double-dose mark on Thursday, just in time for the end of lockdown. Our 80% double-dose target remains October the 31st. A nationwide appeal has been launched to help find a little girl missing from a remote WA campsite for four days. Today, the parents of four-year-old Cleo Smith spoke out as they pray for a miracle. Breaking their silence, hoping for a breakthrough. Yeah, we've been close by. Um, we haven't left. We're just yeah, waiting, waiting for her to come home. Jake Glidden and Ellie Smith's tearful plea to their daughter Cleo, filled with fear, but somehow clinging to hope. I know she can get through whatever she's going through. At the campsite turned crime scene, these seemingly empty shacks could hold the clues to Cleo's disappearance. A family camping trip began late Friday afternoon at the blowholes in McLeod, around 50 kilometres north of Carnarvon. She last spoke with her parents at 1.35am Saturday when she woke up for a drink. When they woke around 6 that morning, she and her sleeping bag had vanished. She won't leave my side if I'm walking in the shops. She would, um, she would never leave that tent alone. It's three days down the track now. She uh, potentially could be anywhere. Authorities are still working on the assumption that little Cleo is alive, but now four days into the search in these conditions, if the four-year-old wandered off, her chances of survival couldn't be more slim. Everyone asks us, like, what, what do you need? And really all we need is a little girl home. Today's rain slowly washing away hope of a miracle. In McLeod, Western Australia, Ben Downey, 7 News. Former American Secretary of State Colin Powell has died with coronavirus. After a lifetime of military service, his biggest mistake was in 2003 when he made the case for war in Iraq using false intelligence about weapons of mass destruction. It's a blot. I'm the one who presented it on behalf of the United Nations, uh, United States to the world, and it will always be uh, uh, part of my, uh, my record. How painful is that? It, it was painful. Uh, it's painful now. The 84-year-old was double vaccinated but was facing multiple health complications. Climate activists are ramping up their attack on the Prime Minister as he prepares a policy of net zero emissions for the Glasgow summit. The Nationals have conceded Scott Morrison will commit to a plan without their full support. It's becoming a daily ritual outside Parliament. Extinction Rebellion protesters gluing themselves to the road, setting off flares. It's just cool. I love cool. As inside, Scott Morrison leads government MPs into a joint meeting of the Liberal and National parties. The Nationals now accepting a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050 is near. The Prime Minister has the final call. That's why he's the Prime Minister. Even Nationals leader Barnaby Joyce knowing the writing is on the wall. We're not going to start trying to even mimic, you know, bullying the Prime Minister or coercing the Prime Minister. We understand the necessity of this. The only MP raising objections at the meeting of government parties, Queensland National Senator Matt Canavan, now privately accepting he's lost the battle, but publicly continuing the fight. The world is moving away. They're moving away from net zero targets just as we are about to embrace them. Scott Morrison knows the world is actually moving towards net zero targets and he should now be able to commit Australia to moving with it at the Glasgow Climate Conference in two weeks' time. Labor wants to know the cost, demanding the government's modelling be released. We'll be doing that before the next election, Mr Speaker. A final decision from the Nationals, though, imminent. We will make sure that the Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Australia 
as a response for, from us by, by the end of this, this week. Allowing final Cabinet endorsement before Scott Morrison flies out next week. Mark Riley, 7 News. Homicide squad detectives have charged the ex-partner of a Bayswater mother found dead in a home nine days ago. Tegan Doling is following this case and Tegan, the man, was in court today. It was a hospital bedside hearing for Benjamin Coleman. He's been charged with killing his pregnant former partner, Michelle Darra. She was a mother of two. The 29-year-old has been receiving care in hospital after being found with life-threatening injuries on October 10. Little information was heard about the case today. The tradie listened to the hearing by a phone, being held to his ear by a police officer, but he was unable to respond. The couple were together for five years and had recently broken up. It's understood Ms Darra returned to the home that day to pick up more belongings. More than $140,000 has been raised for the couple's two little boys, now learning to live without their mother and with their father behind bars. Mitch. Tegan Doling, thank you. The Melbourne Star Observation Wheel could yet be saved. Liquidator Grant Thornton is launching a sales campaign revealing they've had a number of inquiries about keeping it turning. The 120 metre high structure still dominates the skyline, although its iconic lights remain off since it was shut down last month. Jordan Degoe has revealed the extreme lengths he went to for a trip to America, but Tim Watson, it's no holiday. Mitch, he's had to jump through hoops to get there. Mitch Cleary spoke with Degoe this afternoon, and Mitch, he's training the house down. Tim Degoe is training six days a week for the next month as he bids to follow in the footsteps of Christian Petrarca, and he's detailed exactly how he got onto the mountains Let's of California. Let's do it, eh? Let's do it. It's been a, a you know a massive uh, process you could say to get over here. It's not something that happens easy, but I had to go to the U.S. Embassy and, and interviews and whatnot and proof of you know work and, and stuff like that. So it wasn't easy, but um, yeah, grateful to be here. In sport, Dugowie discusses his latest contract talks as he prepares to become the hottest free agent in the game. Tim. Thanks, Mitch. Also ahead, the Cox Plate field set and an Aussie cricket star with some thinking to do, Mitch. I'll see you again soon. OK, Tim. See you then. Thank you. A spectacular implosion has flattened an 18-storey building in the Latrobe Valley. Next, gone in eight seconds, a 57-year-old building reduced to rubble. Also, tears, phone taps and explosive accusations flow at a labour corruption probe. Action at last on one of Melbourne's most dangerous intersections. I'll have the weather live from Endeavour Hills with some good news. Thanks, Jane. Also ahead, how to book a Christmas holiday with confidence. Travel tips from industry insiders. A Melbourne mayor has been reduced to tears, telling an anti-corruption probe he hopes the Labor Party can change. The hearing was played explosive phone taps, revealing a former minister used racism to help hide his secrets. When reporters started digging on questionable donations to a Somali community group, Rick Garotti and Adam Somurek used racism to shut them down. Go back to them that this is a regret, regretful that you're doing this to this community. The African community's got a lot of problems and it's regretful that you're sti really stigmatising the African community. Go away. Well, I might mention the Black Lives thing at a time now. Black Lives Matter and our, our young people are struggling with their identity. IBAC was told Dr Hussein Harako, the founder of the Somali Australian Council, pocketed most of a $75,000 grant, a reward for branch stacking. It's go racism on it, right? Banyal City Council awarded the same group grants which were misused. The mayor breaking down when quizzed if he was ashamed and embarrassed about his conduct. Hopefully for a young, young person coming through the ranks in the future, it's a better culture for them and they don't get caught up. Chanel Vella, 7 News. One of central Melbourne's most notorious intersections is about to undergo a multi-million dollar safety upgrade. Estelle Greepink is in South Bank and Estelle, it's been a long time coming. 
Well, Mitch, residents first raised concerns about this intersection two years ago. Five pedestrians were mown down here back in May when a B-double truck tried to take the corner and instead ended up on the footpath. Back then, residents described this as an accident waiting to happen. But now they finally have some action among the safety upgrades for this intersection, the footpath being widened, so there's more room for pedestrians to walk. And as for the pedestrian crossing itself, it will be moved a little further away from the busy corner the city of melbourne and uh, the city of melbourne and the state government sorry also say they're going to be giving more room for cars and trucks to turn and the south bank residents association has welcomed these changes they say it will provide more protection for pedestrians mitch estelle greeping at south bank thank you the widow of former Richmond footballer Shane Tuck wants a coroner to investigate his treatment by club doctors. Catherine Tuck wants to know why her husband was treated so poorly and badly. The 39-year-old took his own life in July last year. An autopsy confirmed he was suffering from concussion-related illness, CTE. State coroner Judge John Kane says he's not inclined to get involved in a blame game. A spectacular demolition has marked the end of an era in the Latrobe Valley. The last piece of the Hazelwood power plant came crashing down, paving the way for an overhaul of the site. 500 kilograms of explosives ready to go. The 18-storey Boiler House 1 was the last remaining major building at Hazelwood. 20,000 tonnes of steel frame floored. Remnants of the former power station now twisted metal. The demolition of the building had been stalled due to weather, but five months of preparation eventually put into action. It uh, went exactly as planned. Um, and we've got some dust and noise monitoring equipment sitting around the mide void and we'll make those results available to the community in the next day. Shut down four years ago, Hazelwood generated up to a quarter of the state's electricity for almost 50 years. It also emitted vast amounts of greenhouse gases and used huge volumes of water. The enormous former brown coal mine will be the focus of the next big step in rehabilitating Hazelwood. The owners will submit plans to government before the end of the year to fill it with an estimated 650 gigalitres of water. Water really is the best option for the mine void. Following the demolition of eight chimneys and three other boiler houses, this was the last blast at Hazelwood. Once one of the state's most crucial assets, now bound for recycling. It's a bit of an end of an era. Cameron Bow, 7 News. Jane Bunn joins us now from Endeavour Hills. And Jane, it sounds like our weather's going to be something of a blast. <laughs> Mitch, it is turning nice. This is the last of the cool and mostly cloudy. From tomorrow, we begin a stretch of warmth and sunshine. Today only reached 16, but tomorrow should be about 7 degrees warmer. Once early cloud clears, there's bright and warm sunshine that should feel absolutely lovely. And that continues on Thursday and Friday too. Then there is another change to cold and wet. I'll show you when that'll hit after sport, Mitch. Thanks, Jane. Coming up tonight, a backlash over rapidly disappearing bank branches. Also, what caused fire to erupt on a metro train? More parcel delivery delays as drivers prepare to strike. Mining billionaire Twiggy Forest unveils a world first truck. And the yellow wiggle hands over her skivvy. A train has burst into flames at Geelong. Thick black smoke billowed from the old disused carriage, which was in a North Shore yard. Other trains in the area were forced to slow down, but services continued. There were no passengers on board at the time. The move to online banking has soared during the pandemic, meaning more branches are closing. The banks say it's customer driven, but the staff union says it leaves many customers with no choice. While many outlets are dusting off the cobwebs after lockdowns, others have already farewelled their final customers. It's important for a village to have that beating heart, which is the bank. Since the start of the pandemic, more than 350 bank branches have closed nationwide. 
The Commonwealth has closed 95 this year alone, ANZ 52, Westpac 46 and the NAB 26. The Banking Association says the closures are keeping pace with consumer trends, accelerated by COVID. Its research shows 80% of customers now bank online, with more than a third using digital wallets on their smartphones. Australians now overwhelmingly turn to online banking for simple tasks like checking a balance or paying a bill. But when advice is needed, most still prefer face-to-face -face help. Your small businesses who are trying to recover from COVID, they can no longer, you know, duck up the road and do their banking. Three and a half thousand post offices now offer on-site banking, but the retreat of branches will likely continue. Australians are going to use less and less cash. They're going to rely more and more on digital wallets. Gemma Acton, 7 News. We're being warned to expect major delivery delays on Thursday with drivers from three major courier companies planning to strike. Workers from FedEx, Star Trek and alcohol transport business BevChain will walk off the job. Backed by the Transport Workers Union, they say they'll only back down if their demands for better pay and job security are met. Mining billionaire Andrew Forrest has admitted he's one of the reasons climate change exists. But tonight he says he's trying to right the wrongs of the past, unveiling the world's first hydrogen truck. This is the truck Twiggy Forrest wants the world to see. Built in just 130 days at Fortescue's Future Industries plant on the outskirts of Perth. We'll be completely silent. You'll see no fumes. The only exhaust will be 100% pure water. These mighty machines have helped make Twiggy Australia's richest man. But he now admits that immense wealth has come at a cost. I'm a heavy carbon emitter. I am the reason why we have a global warming planet. This is about taking an opportunity to fix a huge problem. And he says it's time our leaders got on board. I'd say the person who, who keeps coming up with false sound bites and is still listened to is Matt Canavan. The Fortescue boss has announced plans to build the country's first hydrogen hub in the National Senator's backyard in Queensland. People know in their gut that there's something a bit sus about this net zero idea where a whole lot of banks and rich people make money but they may lose their job. The revolution won't end with these trucks. The team is already working hard on another world first green fuel powered locomotives. After that, they'll turn their attention to their enormous ships. That's our future, that's Australia's future. Tim McMillan, 7 News. There's a major shake-up at the Wiggles, with Emma Watkins passing on the yellow skivvy to 16-year-old Sahai Hawkins. The newest member will hit the stage in a national tour, joined by the original cast. The yellow and first female Wiggle. I like to eat. Emma Watkins is hanging up her bow. I've had such an amazing time at the Wiggles. 11 years with the skivvy supergroup. Inspired a whole generation of children, especially girls, to uh, get up and dance. Now I'm about to finish my PhD, so I'm going to be devoting more time to my research project. Bringing together performance and sign language. And I just don't Filling those dancing shoes. Hey, Sahai. The youngest wiggle, 16-year-old Sahai Hawkins. I am so thrilled. I'm over the moon. Born in Ethiopia, adopted in Australia, a little big shot at age 12. And world champion Latin dancer, inspired by the Wiggles. That's how I started dancing. My parents were playing Wiggles and I was dancing around the house. Joining the new lineup on tour from February, the originals doing shows for adults who remember them as kids. After collapsing at their last performance, Greg is back and after 30 years, still the Blue Wiggle. I'll be playing one, two, three shows in the daytime and then the fun begins. <laughs> All Cadac, 7 News. Schools across Melbourne are preparing for more students to return. Mike Amor is at Endeavour Hills. Mitch, the staggered return to class is a big test for our schools. Up next, a first-hand look at what's being done to keep our kids safe. 
Thanks, Mike. Also, the best deals to fly to Queensland for Christmas. And coming up, a medical discovery, how asthma develops when a baby's still in the womb. The earlier than expected return to school is welcome relief for Victorian families. Mike Amor is at Endeavour Hills tonight and Mike, final preparations are in place for an influx of students on Friday. Yes, Mitch, COVID safe planning is being put to the test ahead of the return to face-to-face -face learning and that surge of one million pupils from next week. And as I found out today, there'll be a host of measures to help our students thrive in the classroom. After 116 days, students are returning to their familiar surroundings. Kids are jumping out of their skin to get back to school. But after six lockdowns, the school experience will be a little different when the staggered return starts on Friday. We're talking about things like ventilation, we're talking about air purifiers, we're talking about, of course, mask wearing, extra hygiene, cleaning right throughout the day, and of course, staff vaccination. In fact, Glen Eagles Secondary College has doubled up as a pop-up vaccine hub for the entire community. But the priority now is getting education back on track and keeping schools open. If a case happens now, kids are back at home for around 24 hours. We clean the school, we identify where that student has been, all the other kids come back to school. Where wellbeing is one of the number one lessons. Parents can really encourage that too at the end of each day to say, you know, how did it go, what, was, what worked well and what didn't. It's very much about their social interactions and mental health and being back with their friends and engaging in some of the outdoor activities and sport. You know, it's really about them getting back to their way of life and what they love doing. I could not wait to get out the door. I'm so happy I'm back. How hard is it to stay motivated when you're doing the schooling from home? It is extremely difficult. Many times this year, especially in the last six months leading up to exams, I have felt like I've been dragging myself up a hill by the ankles. Mike Amor, Seven News. Mining companies dragged the share market down today. Network Finance Editor Gemma Acton explains. Thanks, Peter. A promising start gave way to a negative close with the ASX 200 shedding six points to end the day at 7,375. Miners were the biggest drag. That's after BHP revealed a drop in its iron ore shipments. The Aussie dollar has shot up, reaching its highest level since early September. That's following the release of minutes from the Reserve Bank's October meeting. And the price of iron ore has pulled back a little. And let's check in on consumer confidence. It's now risen for the past six weeks. And while it's still below the long-term average, which is shown here by the red dotted line, it is back up to where it was in mid-July. Peter. Gemma Acton reporting. There's new research tonight showing asthma originates in the womb. Babies at higher risk of asthma will have structural differences in their airways. Researchers say it highlights the need for pregnancy lifestyle changes to help reduce the chances of developing asthma. One in nine Australians suffers from the condition. Victorians can have confidence to book a trip to Queensland with airlines promising flexible fares and great deals. Tourism operators are being swamped with calls as the Sunshine State prepares to welcome us back. The Great Barrier Reef, the Sundays, Gold Coast theme parks, all back within reach. You can book in confidence and you can come to paradise. If you fly out the first day possible, December 17, here are the best deals. The cheapest flight to the Gold Coast is with Virgin, $99. If you're off to the Sunshine Coast, 155 will get you there, also with Virgin. And to Brisbane, yet again, Virgin's offering the cheapest rate on the 17th, $139. Anyone with Qantas frequent flyer points is in luck. The airline has released the biggest number of reward flights ever, with millions of seats up for grabs and discounts too. It's a great opportunity for our frequent flyers to use those points they've been earning during lockdown and get on their holidays, go and visit their family and friends. And most airlines are offering flexible flights. If you're ready to get out of here, here are a few tips for COVID safe flying. Before you book, check the entry requirements for that state. On the day, check in in advance to save having to queue up. Wear a mask, use the QR check-in code system and have your documents ready to go. Tourism operators say bookings are already rolling in. 
get in early and also consider the destinations that you may not have thought of before. Pack your bags, Victorians. Get ready to fly. Christy Cooper, 7 News. Sport is next with Tim Watson and Tim, a magpie star, wants to emulate a premiership hero. Mitch, you're going to love this. Jordan Ngoi is setting himself up for a big year ahead. Up next, the interview from California on why he headed overseas for the off-season. The Cox played favourite with an eye-catching gallop, but there's one trainer keen for more Valley success. Trouble for David Warner ahead of the T20 World Cup and an awkward training session for Ben Simmons at the 76ers. Welcome back. Collingwood superstar Jordan Degoe is going to extremes to kickstart what he hopes will be a career best season. Speaking from California, Degoe says he wants to emulate a premiership hero and set himself up for the biggest contract of his life. Out of his comfort zone and training six days a week on the other side of the globe. I wouldn't say it's enjoyable. I think it's definitely what I need and, and what's going to get the best out of me. Jordan Ngoi has teamed with renowned US fitness guru Johnny it's Louch, good. combining intense Those gym kind of work with three-hour mountain bike rides at more than 3,000 feet. Day of Obviously, there's starts. a lot of talk about, uh, no about how I'm travelling no. at the moment. Um, and to be honest, yeah, I'm feeling really good. Obviously, this is a complete different side of training that I've, I've never done before. He pushes himself. Like, I've taken athletes on rides and, you know, they quit, and he doesn't quit. After a rigorous process with the U.S. Embassy, Dugowie was granted access to fly overseas through his partnership with Monster Energy. It worked out that I could come over here, fulfil my commitments, my contractual agreements, um, and get all the work and photo shoots and whatnot done over here. Now admitting he's in the best shape of his career, Dugowie hopes to follow in the footsteps of Melbourne Premiership hero Christian Petrarca and turn an impressive end of 2021 into a dominant 2022. To be able to see that off close, mate, um, it just makes me, you know, want to level up my game, I guess you could say, and the start of that's getting over here and pushing myself to the limit. And as he prepares to negotiate the biggest contract of his career as a free agent, Dugowie is appointed brother-in-law and firefighter Ryan Vague as his new agent. Anyone knows that their last 12 months of a contract is, you know, an important time. And for me, really, it's, you know, it starts from now with this pre-season. There's no reason to rush it at this stage. Obviously, there's still a lot of, lot of stuff going on. Um, and, you know, we'll see in the future. Mitch Cleary, 7 News. The field is set for one of the more intriguing Cox plates in recent years with race favourite Zaki firming after an ideal barrier draw. But some of the biggest names in racing are eyeing an upset on Saturday. For close to four months, Zaki has been declared the one to beat for this year's Cox Plate. The Sydney-based star, trained by Annabelle Neesham, looks ready to deliver on the bookie's promise. Well supported into $2.60 after drawing barrier six. But there are nine challenges waiting to pounce, including a champion mare whose trainer knows a thing or two about winning at the Valley. From my point of view, it's a very interesting race. Um, there's no dominant dominant horse this year. Chris Waller, confident, very elegant, can respond after a disappointing Turnbull Stakes earlier this spring. Basically, we put her down to being a little bit flat. She's eating very well, she looks great, and we think she's bounced back. A Cox Plate victory would push Very Elegant into rare air, going ahead of the great Sunline with over $12 million in prize money won on Australian soil. Waller will be hoping for some help from above in the coming days in the form of some rain to help soften up the Mooney Valley track, but he won't be the only Cox Plate contender looking for some cut in the ground. Jane Bunn will keep us up updated, uh, but hopefully she's saying it's going to rain. Kieran Ma saddles up international raider Gold Trip with veteran Damien Oliver on board. Yeah, he's got some great form overseas and, uh, you know, if the rain comes at their forecast, he doesn't mind soft track either. So, you know, he's, um, I'm really pleased with him and I'm looking forward to riding him on Saturday. Hopefully the last Cox Plate at an empty Mooney Valley for some time. Andrew McCormack, 7 News. To cricket now, and there are worrying signs for David Warner ahead of Australia's T20 World Cup opener on Saturday. He was dismissed for a golden duck in a warm-up game against New Zealand, and he's on notice from the new national selector ahead of the Ashes. It is sort of clean slate. You know, for me, absolutely, no one in my in my view, um, past or present, you know, has has the absolute right to be uh, to be in the team. The Aussies chased down 159 and while Glenn Maxwell was rested, he says the IPL helped him reach peak form. Every day I was, I was finding something new out. I was 
been a sponge to um, be at and AB and yeah, it just makes you feel confident, makes you feel happy. The Aussies face the Kiwis again tonight. The Melbourne Stars have suffered a second straight defeat. The Hurricanes posted 152 and the run trace didn't start well. Elise Villani lasted just two balls and they never recovered. Meg landing on strike and it's back to back wickets. She'll remember this one because it is the big one, that of the Melbourne Stars skipper. The Stars bowled out in the final over for just 89. The chances of Novak Djokovic defending his Australian Open crown are fading by the day. In a statement, the world number one is refusing to reveal his vaccination status, saying it's a private matter and inappropriate to even ask. I don't think that the person you indicated or any other tennis player, let's not personalise it, any other tennis player or golfer or, uh, or, or Formula One driver will even get a visa to get here. The government is yet to enforce a vaccine mandate on international athletes. And Ben Simmons is expected to address the media tomorrow for the first time since his standoff with the 76ers. It's then we'll find out if he'll play in Philly's season opener against New Orleans on Thursday. Although judging by the team huddle at the end of practice, he looked less than interested before leaving the court. Not sure his heart is exactly in it just yet, Mitch. He that, may need some more convincing. That's totally orcs, as the young people say these days, don't they? Do they? Very is, well, we say awkward. <laughs> How do you spell that? They go with A W K S. Thank you very much. Something every day. Yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Heading back to Endeavour Hills now, Jane. Tomorrow looks like the pick of the week. Oh, tomorrow is absolutely lovely, Mitch. It's staying warm for Thursday and much of Friday too. The full details come next. Hello, Michael Usher here. Tonight on the latest from 7 News, inside the desperate search for Cleo Smith, I'm joined by a senior police officer involved in that investigation. 70% of eligible Australians to be fully vaccinated within hours. Will it change anything? And we're live to Athens for the Winter Olympics torch handover. Hope you can join me. The latest 7 News, 11.10. Hello again on another cool and mostly cloudy day, but this is the last one in this stretch. We'll change to warmer sunshine from tomorrow. The city began on nine. It was as cold as five in outer suburbs at first. Then this afternoon, 16 to 18 around town. Showers began passing through late morning and continued through the afternoon. They were moving quickly, pushed in on southeasterly winds. So when it rained, it was just for a few minutes, then dry weather returned. Now these showers have now completely dried up. With that wind direction, it is Gippsland that has the most of the wet weather. Showers are streaming in, lots of them on the radar there, but in between each there is a sunny break. Some of the clouds spilled over into the southwest of the state, while the north had a mainly sunny but cool day. The wet weather is coming from a low just off Gippsland, connected to a trough that is running up the east coast. But there is a high that is just to our south, and that is taking over control of our weather from tomorrow. That high moves to our east, and that means we're turning warmer with lots of sunshine. In Melbourne, Wednesday it should be absolutely lovely. Sunny and about 7 degrees warmer than today. The warmth continues on Thursday and Friday too. But of course, as soon as we get out of lockdown, that is when our next weather change hits. Expect a warm day on Friday, about 24, but around 5pm there's a gusty wind change and that leaves us cold for Friday night with wet weather too. So if you're heading out on Friday night, do be prepared for cold and wet weather after a lovely day. Around the nation tomorrow, Brisbane has the risk of a severe storm, otherwise partly cloudy and 27. Lots of showers in Sydney, also the risk of a storm. Adelaide heating up, rising to 30. Perth has howling winds and lots of showers. To Victoria, Gippsland still has showers. They'll ease there in the afternoon. Otherwise, there is a fog and low cloud. They'll clear during the morning to lots of warmer sunshine. In moderate east to northeasterly winds. And just some wispy high cloud coming in from the west. Closer in, a foggy low cloud clears most areas before 9am. But in Geelong and Torquay, it could last until midday. But once that has moved away, it is a lovely and sunny day, letting temperatures jump up. 
The city should already be 20 degrees by lunchtime, a top of 23. A lovely Wednesday, warm and sunny. To the eight-day outlook, the warmth does continue for the rest of the week on Thursday, about 24, lots of sunshine, all dry. On Friday, I'm expecting 24 as well, but there is a big change due late in the afternoon. Temperatures will plummet. There's lots of showers moving through a wet Friday night. So Saturday, 17, Sunday, 16, the odd shower moving through. Then we will warm up again next week by Tuesday, 22. Then Wednesday, it could even reach 26 degrees. So after early cloud, it's a lovely day tomorrow. Warm sunshine, letting it rise up to 23. And that warmth continues until that next big change arrives later Friday, Mitch. Enjoying the roller coaster ride. Thank you very much indeed, yes. Jane. Now, here's what's on sunrise tomorrow. Thanks, Mitch. Tomorrow on Sunrise, goodbye Melbourne, hello holidays. Get the jump on Christmas travel, where you can go, when you can go and what's booking up fast. See you in the morning, Victoria. And that's the way it is this Tuesday, the 19th of October. Thanks for your company. For now, from the team, good night.